We're at kind of a crossroads. The trees don't produce nuts and Houston is developing this way. What are we gonna do with the land? No other house within 50 miles of here has a steel truss bridge that connects two parts of the house, I promise you. On paper is one thing, then on the site, it's a lot more uh, complicated. Unless you're a pecan farmer or an equestrian enthusiast, you've probably never heard of the town of Fulcher, Texas. This was a family ranch since the 1920s. My grandfather was driving out here, I guess, in 1920, blew a tire, looked over and saw this land and decided that's where he wanted to build his ranch. He planted about 7,000 pecan trees out here. Those trees are, are past their useful life now, and they don't produce nuts. Lying just outside of the Houston metropolitan area, this rich and thriving community is in one of the fastest growing counties in the US. We're at kind of a crossroads. The, the trees don't produce nuts, and Houston is developing this way. From that, we kind of uh, decided, what are we going to do with the land? What are we going to do with the area? and beautiful development is kind of where I saw it going. In Fulcher lies Orchards Epicon Acres, a brand new development that focuses on the landscape and ties the house into nature itself. So I sat down with the designer, the structural engineer, and the project manager to figure out how this went from backyard barbecue idea to the reality that it is today. Let's take a look. David and I are neighbors. <laughs> we would get together and, and have beers on the back, back patio. And, and then one time he said, hey, I've got some land and I've got an idea. I wanted to go ahead and start a spec house without having the infrastructure complete for a bigger development. But I need somebody that can help with some technical stuff. So this is kind of the test piece. This is the first of many. You ask me to design something, I can do it for you, but you're gonna to have to tell me exact specifics on what you want. Exact specifics? Well, there's just one problem. I am not an architect. <coughs> I'm in the oil and gas royalty business. Uh, excuse me? We knew that David has vision. I mean, it, it, that is one thing that he definitely has is vision. That's something I personally don't have. Thank gosh for the internet because, and H-O-U-Z-Z -Z and all this, you can just, um, house. yeah, house, sorry. <laughs> Obviously, David did enlist an incredible architect that drew up the specifications. But David's vision for this house didn't come solely from the internet. Traveled enough uh, and seen some pretty neat houses in my life. A lot of what I saw in Europe and Norway impressed me in that there was a natural feel when you walked into the house. I saw one in particular. I was fortunate enough to spend enough time in it that I looked at every detail of the house. It was an incredible um, eye-opening experience for me and to a point where I said, you know what, I want to build that. Uh, something like that, I should say. And that is where this came from, actually, uh, is, is I said, I want to see if I can get that feeling that you feel uh, in a house that is, is designed as a work of art, but a living work of art where you feel comfortable in it. And, and I think that's what we have here. Lucky for David, he happened to live next door to a structural engineer. I graduated from Texas A&M with a degree in offshore engineering. Yes, as in not land. And spent 20 years designing steel structures offshore, which are not pretty. They're gray and they're ugly. That's right, he designs ugly things. And I'm not sure that's what David had in mind. To actually build something that has to look good and be functional, that was something that uh, took a little doing. Although Shannon didn't have a background in architecture, 
His vast experience in engineering steel structures was exactly what this project needed. He's got the vision and, and I have the technical know-how. I think that's why we make a good team. So we have an amazing architectural idea and the perfect team to oversee it, but who's actually going to build it? My initial thought was, well, is he crazy? <laughs> We had, the, uh, we had the right manpower and the right knowledge as far as engineering and architectural to get it done, to get all these components put in place. On paper is one thing, then on the site it's a lot more uh, complicated. Now this is a garage but there's a lot of engineering that goes into creating a four car hangar style garage door like this one. The garage door is 12 feet tall and 30 feet wide and it goes up in one, one solid piece. So it, it, it's like an airplane hangar door. Uh, and designing the foundation for that and the mechanism for it to, to actually function correctly, it was a huge, huge design challenge. Our hangar door works off hydraulics and that thing weights roughly 11,500 pounds. Just the glass alone is about 3,000 pounds, and then all the steel that went into it. So uh, we had to make some adjustments to the actual structure of the house, meaning the foundation, the framing, steel components. Once it's open, you can see how big the garage is. Uh, but more importantly, what I think is the coolest part about it is that this like creates an instant gathering place outside. You want to have a party outside? Look at this canopy that just, just got created, you know, just like that. I'm not sure you could find a, a, a more interesting garage. Even though it's a blank slate right now, it's going to be something cool. We have lots of choices for the f folks that built, buy this out. That uh, Some elevated staircases to the polo perch up top. There's, there's a perch up on top of the house that we built after the fact. When we were framing the house, we got up there and realized that the view across the lake back here, you can see a polo field. We saw some guys playing polo out there. Uh, so we said, you know what, it wouldn't be hard to change this frame around a little bit and build a porch on top of the roof. Wait a second. This was easy to throw in? The polo perch wasn't the only adjustment along the way. So there was a lot of uh, adjustments where Shannon had to come out to the job site and explain to us his vision of how things should be done and serves its purpose and function and it still looks, you know, architecturally pleasing. The Fulcher House is truly impressive. The unique pod design mixed with both modern architecture and sustainable materials make this a one-of-a-kind project. One thing you might notice as you walk through this house is that it's not entirely complete, but that's actually by design and one of the things that makes this project so unique and unconventional. We give the clients a shell and then they can come and, you know, customize their house, you know, select all the finishes. We control how the outside comes together. If you build it to, to one style, you might, you're limiting yourself to a certain buyer. You get these clients that buy multi-million dollar houses and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to renovate them just because they don't like how how they look on the inside. So we figured that by giving the client the option to customize it to their taste, it'd give us a, a unique position in the market. The, the downside of that is a lot of people when they're buying a house need the vision finished. They need to see what, what they're getting. Uh, it's hard for them to envision what they might want to do. And we just, we just decided that we were gonna go ahead and hope that somebody came by and saw this as a blank canvas and it's ready for them to help finish the, the beauty of the, the art of this house with the finish out. The way this house is different than many other houses is you know what materials we use, how we put them together. They're not standard materials, so our stone was custom made at the quarry for this house a certain dimension. This retaining wall looks beautiful and it keeps the house from flooding in case of a hurricane. 
but it created some big challenges when it came to the foundation of the home. We brought in big quarry stones and then we had to basically build a cutting you know, system where we brought in a big chop saw that they used on the freeways and roads. And we built a rail system to set the stones, bring them up to the saw and chop them up. The foundation actually goes down seven feet below that. Uh, so the wall is just, it's just there for show. The actual strength is in the concrete foundation. Uh, and the day we had uh, the foundation poured, uh, it was really eye-opening to see how much concrete was required and how much rebar was required to make a foundation like that. It's something that, that you just don't see in the residential area at all. Over 40 concrete trucks show up the day that we poured and one of them flipped over on the way here. It was three in the morning, four in the morning when they were showing up. But it was just uh, it was amazing to see all these concrete trucks and having them cycle. One of the good things was that we're in basically separate pots, so it helped to pour one pot, then the next one, and you know, tie it all in. But it was a really unique experience dealing with this foundation and the retaining wall. Now this is brilliant. A glass and steel structure suspended over water connecting the living area pod to the master bed pod. The epitome of form and function, but designing, engineering, and building a structure like this is no easy task. David came and said, hey, I got this great idea. I want to make a bridge between the two pods over water. And there's, there's only a few ways you can solve a problem like that, and, and none of them are cheap. We actually had the bridge in place before any other part of the house was actually built. Uh, we put the bridge in place right after the foundation was poured, uh, simply because uh, we needed a large crane in order to put it in place, uh, and that, that gave us you know, plenty of clearance where we, we actually built the house around the bridge. It's, it's designed out of a four by six uh, steel tube. 3 16 and quarter inch thick uh, steel tube. So it's a substantial structure. You know, we live in a hurricane zone here, uh, and so there's certain building codes that we have to follow. Uh, so that sort of ramped up the size of the bridge quickly, but then the length of the bridge also. Uh, it's, it's over 40 feet long, a pretty significant size for something in a residential uh, setting, you know. Our bridge, that's about 12,000 pounds right there. Just a steel plus talking about another 4,000 pounds of glass in it. So that bridge alone weighs about 16,000 pounds. And it's all supported on two ends. So that was a pretty unique part of the, of the project. There's no true structural attachment between the bridge and the house because the bridge, with our heat fluctuations that we get here in Texas, the bridge is actually gonna expand at a dip, much different rate than the house will. And so if we physically attach them two together, the two together, it would crack and eventually it would just not look great. So we kept it detached. Any attachment that you see between the house and the bridge is only superficial. And that way we can handle those, that, that temperature expansion because of the length of it. Um, it's, a, it's a problem that, um, uh, you don't really notice until you start to get really long structures like this. But you can see it's a four by six rectangular tubing. Uh, that's what we use for the whole thing. Um, it was welded at a shop about uh, 10 miles from here and then transported over here. So how did you bring in all of this wiring and how are you, how are you gonna regulate the temperature of what is essentially uh, a, a greenhouse. Yeah. So you can feel right now, since we don't have the air on, you can feel the heat coming in from yeah. the window. So we have these registers here, these small uh, sort of mini um, uh, registers that um, uh, this side is, this is fed from that side of the house and those are fed from the other side of the house, uh, the other pod. And that's what um, we, we actually had to bring air into the bridge. Um, but there's a very small pitched roof above the bridge and we had to cram everything in there. Uh, there's really not a whole lot of room. I think those two uh, components is also probably what people find the coolest in this, in this house. I mean, how many houses do you have that have steel and glass bridges and garage doors, right? Nothing in Texas exists that looks like this house. And when people stop and they, they stop on the road or, or they see it in pictures, the first word is just wow. Uh, and to be a part of something like that, it, it's a big deal for me. So I owe it to my, my family, I owe it to my neighbors to keep this uh, as beautiful as I possibly can. 
I just want to see the houses that go out here, the estates that are built, um, architecturally significant, architecturally interesting. There's an idea, then there's the reality. A concept, then comes to the construction phase. These are the dichotomies that every architect, builder, designer, contractor, project manager, and anyone in between has to face when building a project like this. And in this case, Santiago, David, and Shannon came together beautifully along with their teams, not because they all thought the same, but because of their different perspectives. And that's why we have the Fulcher House. I'm Ben Roberts, and this has been Design vs. Build.